we need people to watch, we should be letting them get closer to the tributes before the games to make the stakes personal. Who will watch the games if they care what happens to the tributes? Everyone. People need someone to root for and someone to root against. We need them to invest. And if we bend... <laughs> At the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes returns us to the world of the Hunger Games, but this time 64 years earlier and through the opposite lens. And this time our hero is Cornelio... Cor... Corey Snow, a capital city student who must mentor musician Lucy Gray from District 12 to victory in the Hunger Games Battle Royale. Oh. Or at least make her look good while losing, because otherwise he cannot go to school. And the best way to sum up this movie is to borrow the words of the late great Immortan Joe, mediocre. Which is weird because there's some really good stuff here, like the main relationship between Snow and Lucy. Two people born to be apart are forced to bond together for a situation where they need each other. But is their bond real? Do they care about each other or only themselves? Are they in a hunger game of betrayal and manipulation of their own? After everything I've done for you! Very cool as well as timely. And that's not weird, since the screenwriters here are very talented. And though I've never read the books, when an author comes up with lines like this, Snow lands on top. I'm pretty sure that author is talented as well. So on that front, oh, never f mind. I f hate these writers. No wonder this movie is so f***ing forgettable. For real though, there's nothing strikingly wrong with this movie, which is why I initially thought it would be too difficult to cover. So we might consider your inspired ideas. No thanks. Please. No thanks. Especially compared to my last couple of videos. But for some reason, it just failed to make an impact, like a bucket of water in the ocean. It did all right, but not really when you compare it to the franchise and to other similar franchise returns that did make a splash relative to their size. So what then is the issue? Well, I'd argue it's that there's a new toxic phrase that Hollywood has yet to learn. Go mid, go broke. That's what this movie is, mediocre, which in today's world of entertainment is no longer enough to buy interest. And that mediocrity is born from the fact that it's a franchise movie. Whereas before, sequels and prequels were Hollywood steroids, now they've gone bad and started to harm the user. Or to try some prosy writing myself, the key problems with The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and other franchise movies like it are essentially these. It sits by a fireplace that doesn't produce warmth. It stands on the shoulders of a giant that has vanished into the fog of time. It races down a track that loops around. That's why this movie failed to make an impact. And because for a change, I'd like a challenge. In this video, I'll go through this movie and explain further to try to convince you to agree. Here's why Hollywood franchise movies today often fail. The first franchise problem with this movie is that it doesn't create entertaining content, but rather believes that the franchise's existence in the content is enough to entertain. As a good example of what I mean, look at the beginning, where for a long time, nothing is done. In a flashback opening, two kids are running around in a war-torn capital city. They toss a trash can at a dog. They see a guy preparing a gourmet meal. And then they go home to hear that the head of their family, who we never met, has passed. That's it. Okay. Then we jump years ahead to watch Adult Snow go about his day. He talks with his family about stuff like his shirt. I told Fabricia at work that she needed to bleach her white. He walks across a better looking capital city. He goes to school where some annoyingly posh rich kids mingle. I'm gonna vulgar it with their fingers. He listens to speeches from his quirky teachers like this washed up drunk. And then everybody sits down to watch the Hunger Games draft on TV. Let the ceremony begin. And at this point, let's pause for a moment to look at the content during these opening 13 minutes. What is there to be entertained by? Well, mostly the fact that it's the Hunger Games. You know, these are the dark days that I guess you've heard about in the other movies. This guy is the guy who I guess is some guy in the other movies. This is the capital city you know from the other movies. This is the school and the students. Oh, and look at this. This is the Hunger Games draft. You know, the Hunger Games. District 1. 
goes to Livia Cardu. Yes, this is a fire. It is the Hunger Games, but you don't really get anything from that. Nothing special is done with that. You just have to sit by the fire and pretend to feel warm because it's a fire and fire is warm. It's the Hunger Games, which you know is entertainment, and therefore you should be entertained, right? Wrong! This is... This is... This is... What? This is boring. And although there are exceptions, for a long time, this over-reliance on the franchise's existence as the source of entertainment is the problem. Nothing is created. There are no tough obstacles for the hero to overcome, no meaningful consequences for him to consider and deal with. It's just a bunch of scenes set in the franchise's world. The fighters from the other districts arrive at the capital, so Snow jumps into their truck to meet his own fighter, Lucy Gray, until he's taken away with no repercussions. I'm moving for the game makers to disqualify you as mentor immediately. Don't you your mouth, you'll do nothing. You'll do fucking nothing. Snow comes to give Lucy food when suddenly his douchebag schoolmate who we don't know or like is killed by her fighter who we also don't know. Then Snow goes to meet his quirky teacher and has to watch another lying schoolmate put her hand into a tank of snakes and be given antivenom. Then Snow goes to give Lucy rat poison to cheat with by just taking the poison from home and giving it to her. That's all. Nothing is done with that. He doesn't have to avoid guards to get the poison to her, doesn't have to worry about the ramifications of helping her because so far there have been none. Oh and look, when they go check out the Hunger Games arena, there's a bombing by the rebels. You know, the rebels who aren't really in the movie but somehow blow the place up anyway. And so then Snow gets pinned down by a rock and and Lucy stays to lift it up with her bare hands and that's it. Wow, what a scene. How did the filmmakers come up with this? Yes! Hell yeah! Hey, come on, baby! My point is that the value of scenes rarely goes beyond the franchise elements in play in them. This movie is kind of like the Hunger Games arena itself. Nothing is done with it to make it cool or awesome or special or anything. It's a big empty hole. Most of its value comes from the name on the wall. And I'm sorry Hollywood, but that doesn't work anymore. Revisiting the past is so common nowadays that the act itself no longer carries value. Yes, it can still be enough to get by, but at this point it's a game of diminishing returns. Even with the most valuable IP, you must still create special entertainment from it, not rely on the illusion of entertainment coming with it. You need your own specific course of value, like how the original hero created scenes by being an archer. Instead of Snow being a guy who walks around, he should be something from which the value of his scenes is born, like a survivalist. He needs to go meet Lucy at night, so he packs his bag full of stuff to make that happen in his way. A military compass to find another way there, a fire starter to distract the guards, a tri-folding shovel to dig a hole into Lucy's cage, a field hatchet to give to her to cheat with. Now there's entertainment created from who Snow is. And that's a subscriber of Bespoke Post, a membership club that delivers a monthly box of awesome top shelf goods like what I just described and more. Oh. 90% of their products come from small under the radar brands, many of which are US based and so in each box members like Snow get around $70 of value for a lower cost. You can preview every box to see if it's for you no. and change it to another or skip that month if you want. Yes. In the weekender box you get that high quality canvas bag, in the split box you get that carbon steel hatchet built to last and you can join the club for free to see more. Bespoke Post is offering 20% off your first box of awesome with code FILMENTO20, so check the link below to do their specificity defining preference quiz and get more for less. The second franchise issue with this movie is that it doesn't make the audience invest in what happens, but rather relies on the audience already being invested in the franchise. When it's time for the fighters to begin the battle royale, a lot of the central context is still missing, like the stakes. 
Why is it so important for us to see Lucy survive? What awaits her back home that's so crucial for her to return to over everyone else? I don't know, we didn't see anything over home or life except for the draft on TV. But that home is District 12, which I think is the home of the original heroes, so but of course we should root for her. You make it home now. And on the other side, why is it so important for us to see Snow win the prize money? Why, why does prize money matter when others are literally fighting for their lives? Well, he needs that money to pay rent on his family mansion and go to school to restore his family status. He's trying desperately to fit in. We'll be able to pay the rent. Snow lands on top. Now, what is it he intends to study and what is that family status he must restore? I don't know, it's never really on screen, but I guess I should know from the other movies. You know, he's that guy, of course he must get the money to afford to keep his family in a mansion. Of course, of course. Oh, except even he eventually forgets all about that and none of these things actually matter. Where are you? We have to move out. Oops. I forgot. And maybe so far this feels like nitpicking, but in this way, a lot of what's needed to fully invest in this experience is not present. The movie has been built on the shoulders of a giant, the earlier movies, that you cannot see from where this movie stands, which limits the size of its potential audience. What on earth is going on? The main source of character conflict is the rift between districts. Oh, it's very powerful to see Snow and Lucy bond together because they're from different districts and thus should hate each other. She's district. She knows we hate her and she wants us dead. Except I have no idea why. I have never seen any prejudiced hostility or scuffles or fear between everyday people of the capital and the districts. And based on what I see, everyday people seem to like each other just fine. I mean, sure, the capital has police in the districts to oppress them, but I don't really know why, because they don't seem to do anything except when there's a murder. A peacekeeper and two mine bosses were shot dead. FBI, open up! Like, what's their ultimate reason for being there? To steal the district's resources for the capital and its citizens or something? I don't know, maybe I'm just supposed to know. And even with the police, they're everywhere. It doesn't seem to be a case of the capital versus the districts, but more so the government versus the people. Where's the context for the conflict between everyday non-government people? I'm here to help you. I say we all kill him. I'm in. What? Well, maybe it's the war. You know, the war between the capital and the districts, which made the capital create the Hunger Games. There's the conflict. Understandable. <laughs> Except again, what war? I've never seen a border crossing war. I've never seen a clear reason for war. I've never seen the effect of the Hunger Games on normal people. I haven't really seen any rebellion. I have no tangible evidence of any of it. All I see is an explosion at the 40 minute mark by a non-existent perpetrator destroying the arena where children are forced to hurt each other, which sounds like reason enough for anyone to have done it. But I guess all this war and rebel and conflict stuff is in the other movies, so uh, okie dokie. What happened? It was a rebel bombing. The rebels released a message. They said they wanted to tear down the symbol of the Hunger Games. On Even with the Battle Royale, so much is missing. The fighters, for instance, get almost zero development, so most of it's just empty and confusing. How does this one woman suddenly become a mob boss willing to kill a little girl like it's doing the laundry? This should be easy. Why does she seem to hate Lucy who she's almost never interacted with? You mind if I take this one? Not a chance. Why don't they all just like not kill each other? What happens then? How do we know that winning matters when there's no past winner character in the movie to show that the winner actually survives? Oh, and why the hell is there a little girl in this battle arena? How did she get drafted? How's the drafting even work? As the first round pick, District 8 is proud to select this nine-year-old girl who will most likely be f***ing useless. I don't know, I guess I'm just supposed to know. Why build stuff like proper jealousy between characters in this movie when you can just not do the work and rely on the audience already knowing that? That uh, there's always jealousy toward the popular Hunger Games fighter or something. Yeah, Lucy gets these donations for the game and you're supposed to just know it's a lot even though so far there's no relativity shown with prices or other fighters donations. Yeah, the donations can be used to send stuff to the fighters except all that sent is water that usually doesn't even arrive. Whatever, you know all this stuff from the other movies so you are invested in it. 
No, I'm sorry, but no. It's okay to build upon the past, but not everything can depend on the past. What's the point of standing on a giant if the giant's height cannot be seen from where you stand? Why make a movie that new or casual audiences cannot get fully into? Even in a franchise movie, the context for why to invest in that movie must exist in the movie. The third franchise issue with this movie is that it can't fully do something new because it's stuck doing the same old things that come with the franchise. And to best explain what I mean, let's look at the best element here, the relationship between Snow and Lucy. These are two different people from two different worlds meant to hate each other who are forced together to survive an ordeal. An ordeal which brings them closer and makes them catch feelings. That's the cutest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. The question is, are the feelings real or is it manipulation both ways? Are they in fact in a hunger game of their own where only one can survive and where one must be willing to do anything to survive? That's really good. The last portion of the movie is really good. Lucy Gray! I said, are you trying to kill me? There's only one problem. This really good element is not able to shine because it's a Hunger Games movie and thus must drive around the same Hunger Games track. For example, the manipulation aspect of the relationship is pretty non-existent. Why? Because of the game. When the game begins, Snow and Lucy have met five times. Their first meeting, Snow bringing food, discussing strategy, checking out the arena, and Snow giving Lucy rat poison to cheat with. And that's not enough. There hasn't been enough time for any real seduction or manipulation or secret betrayal or anything. No scene where Lucy executes a cheeky plan to get Snow to help her at any cost. So you're an orphan, like me. No scene where Snow secretly gets rid of Lucy's nice friend so that he doesn't weigh her down. Are you gonna share everything that I give you with Joseph? No scene where Snow puts himself in real danger because he's so desperate to help Lucy. No moment at all where we could get fully into the question of are they just using each other or not. No, everything's on random express mode. Lucy Gray. Lucy's friend was bitten earlier by some rodent and then he gets rabies and dies when it's convenient for everyone. Of water, send him a drone. Scare him. Yes. Snow does some pretty easy and conveniently unfolding stuff to help Lucy and with no indication he'll get in real trouble. Easy. Lucy leans in to kiss Snow, which doesn't change anything because he already brought the rat poison to help her cheat anyway. You know, because in the next scene the game has to already start, so we gotta get going. And once the game is over, the movie then changes to find another topic to build potential manipulation and betrayal around. The relationship is no longer about surviving a mandatory arena, no longer about manipulating the other to give you what you need. Now it's about something else pretty randomly happening and both sides getting filled with paranoia. They torture the people they catch for information here, even peacekeepers. I'm so sorry, I should have dealt with those guns myself. Almost like an epilogue of a whole other movie. If I'm not yet making sense, look at the love aspect of the relationship. For this movie to work, the audience must care about the bond between these two. And because the game separates them so early, there's no time for that. They've met briefly for a few times. That's not enough to make this love bond seem real or really powerful. Nobody in the audience is looking at this like, oh my god, I hope they win because I can't stand to see them lose each other. No, Snow needs to win to get money for reasons we don't care about. Give me rent. Lucy needs to win to keep her life because she's the hero, but not strongly enough for us to root for her to kill the others or anything. We don't care that much. We do care at the end because the end is well written, but not enough for it to make a huge impact, because the game came in to put this relationship on ice for the time being. Because apparently Hunger Games means that now the characters can no longer interact or influence each other personally. Hey! You can't attack the tributes. I'm just sending water. Wow, what an amazing My main point here is this. The crux of a franchise cannot come in the way of what the new addition wants to do. A racing movie needs racing, but not necessarily the same track. A Jurassic Park movie needs dinosaurs, but not necessarily an amusement park. A Hunger Games movie needs some form of a battle royale, but not for it to begin in an arena in the beginning of the second act. 
if what you're doing is interesting, nobody in the audience will be like, why hasn't the battle arena started yet? Because it has started, just in another way, with another turn on another track. The heart of this movie is this relationship, so that's what it should have been about. Not about two different versions of it mandated by the franchise's concept. Yeah, first let's do the traditional arena relationship where the heroes need each other, and then let's do this more delicate paranoia relationship where the heroes are just kinda with each other. No, it's nearly a three hour movie and there still wasn't time for both. The result was mediocre, which is no longer enough, not even in popular franchises. For audiences to show up, you need to give them a big reason to do so, even if it means paving another track that may or may not lead to choices unusual to the franchise.